coming up on this week's episode. We take a look back at the latest F1 news. What's happening with Colton Herta, Nick De Vries and Daniel Ricciardo. Stefano Domenicali is looking to propose changes to the weekend format. Monaco is confirmed to empty your pockets in 2023. Alpine consider discontinuing their driver academy and Red Bull and Porsche deal turned sour. Welcome to the Late Night Race Review. Welcome back, everyone, and thanks for joining us. There's been a fair bit of F1 news of late, so let's not hang about and just jump straight into this. I'm Dave Jericho, and as always, I'm joined by Owen Scott and Isidro Gonzalez. So how are we, guys? How's uh, how's everybody's weekend, Scotty? Yeah, good. Good, good, good. Um, no racing, which sucks, and a lot of interrupted football matches, so sport is few and far between, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, 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 been, it's been grim. Isidro, how have you been managing? Uh, it's been a nice weekend, I have to say. Quite sunny. <laughs> you couldn't it's care less. Uh, <laughs> shame about the football, though. I mean, the old lady dies and suddenly everything gets <laughs> And there goes everybody from the UK that we had on our, on our listeners. Thanks for that one. Uh, <laughs> He's Portuguese, forgive him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He knows not what he says. Exactly. All right, well, look, let, let's, let's just jump straight into it because we've got a hell of a lot to cover. There's been a lot... There's been a lot more going on usual, than usual, actually, in, in F1, I find, in for the news. So let's jump straight into Colton Herta um, and what looks like Red Bull obviously have resigned themselves now to him not being in that Alpha Tauri for 2023. Um, obviously, the sticking point of this deal was him being able to obtain, obtain um, his super license. He's currently on 32 points and he needed 40 points. And he only finished 10th in the IndyCar series this year. So the FIA weren't willing to grant an exemption for him for that. And the likelihood is he's possibly, he was supposed to be looking at other series. Um, but that doesn't look like, you know, I think Red Bull have maybe just stepped away completely. So it's not going to happen. But on Colton Herda, I want to address the, the elephant in the room here, Scotty. And like, I've no doubt he's, Colton Hurt is a good driver. Um, okay, his his tenth place in IndyCar this year, maybe not uh, putting him up there in lights. Mm. But were there other drivers being overlooked? Like I know this isn't going to happen, but was there other drivers being overlooked here? Perhaps because Colton Hurt is American and the recent growth F one has ha- has or is having in the United States at the moment. Yeah, I mean y- you've addressed it there within the question. That's the reason that they were going to uh, Colton Hurt. It was because of, it was the United States and they're trying to build that market. It's the the fastest growing market for them at the moment. And you can understand why they're going there. But I, I, re- and I was thinking about this today. I really feel there should be, um, it should be mandatory to go through F2, not necessarily even F3, but F2 and compete in F2 for a year and see how you get on before you get into F1. Um, and yes, there is. There's tons of drivers there that are being overlooked. Um, uh, Drogovic and um, anyone that's in the in the top five in the in the yeah. F2 should should automatically get a, um, in ahead of of Colton Hurt, I believe. Anyway, well, I'd say what what you were saying there as well about drivers that want to get into F1 should come through F2. I think that's going to split opinion because I think a lot of people do believe that um, IndyCar is sort of you know is is a very competitive series it is a very competitive series um but it is looked upon by the FIA in a different light given the way the points for super license are sort of doled out um for the positions given um so like what do you think is either like what what's next here then for Colton Hurt and what's the, what's the next move do you think there's an option for him to come in in 2024 uh stick it out with IndyCar for next year hope i mean he has to finish i think um Oh God, I'm gonna have to shoot this from the top of my head, but I'm thinking he has to finish fifth or higher in the championship next year to get the points he's need needed for his super license. So, what do you think? Do you think he just he sticks it out in IndyCar, gambles that he's going to get into the top five in the championship, and hope that maybe in 2024 there's going to be a seat available? Um, like, what what do you think? What, what's what's your thoughts on this one? Uh, it would be that he could wait for another year, drive in IndyCar racing. And maybe uh, Red Bull would have some sort of uh, agreement saying, you've finished top five, we we sign you on. Otherwise, you're not coming. <laughs> <Something> <laughs> like that. 
Azidra, I wish those, I, I wish we were doing video. You said that like I, I thought it was in a I thought I thought it was in the Godfather here or something. <laughs> and you were about to gra grant me a wish on the birthday. Like uh, <laughs> you must give me mot uh, motivation to to drive well in the car racing, not just say drive for a year and then yeah you can come with us. Just uh, set some sort of uh, goal for him, top five, and then uh, you can join us. Yeah, it is a bit unfair for him, though, in the sense that he's like, I mean, look, he opted to go for IndyCar. It is a competitive series and he has gotten the results. Had he got those results in F2, um, the points would have been enough on his super license. Um, but the same results in uh, in IndyCar series just doesn't seem to cut it. Um, but I mean, look, he, he may, like you say, he may come for 2024. I mean, who knows what will happen with Yuki Tsunoda and whether he's going to get a long-term deal, whether it's going to be a one- or two-year deal. Um, but uh, And then, of course, we're going to move on to Nick DeFries now as well to see what's uh, what's happening with that. So it does look like Gasly is off to Alpine. Uh, and then, obviously, as we've been saying, Colton Hurt has moved to Al Alphatari is, well, com completely off at this stage. So it brings Nick DeFries' name sort of into the spotlight and it was confirmed by Nick De Vries that he's ha had talks already with Helmut Marco in the past tw tw and in the past 24 hours, should I say, there's been multiple sources now reporting that a deal is likely or even it's it's getting close to a deal being announced. Now, it is rumored. There's no confirmed source on that deal, but there is a lot of sources mentioning it. And usually when there's a lot of sources, there's a bit of truth possibly floating around on that. Um, but Scotty, like he, he's shown how quick he can adapt to a race car, given he started in Monza that weekend in the Aston Martin and finished uh, with two points on race day with a Williams. But are people getting a bit giddy throwing the Freeze's name around so early on uh, and, and linking him to that Alpha Tauri seat off the back of his result in Monza? I mean, we barely were hearing his name linked to any seat prior to Monza, and he's after getting sort of two points on a track that suited Williams. Um, I mean, clearly Helmut, Mar Helmut Marco isn't, uh, doesn't think so. He's, he's happily getting giddy. I mean, he's already assumed the, the position <laughs> for, <laughs> for, for, for Nick DeFries. And if rumors are to believe there's possibly a deal in the works, as we were mentioning earlier. Yeah. So I don't know, Scotty, what do you think? Uh, is it too soon or are you rushing to get your knee pads on and join the queue behind Helmut Marco? The knee pads are on. Um, <laughs> I agree. Um, I, I think we should be getting excited about this young fella. The the way that he adapted um, as quickly as he adapted to perform how he did. Uh, OK, it was a Williams car that suited Monza, but also uh, <laughs> Latifi was driving a Williams car that suited Monza in air, quote, air quotes and nothing happened. So 100 percent, I'm on board with this guy. I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. I am down with Nick DeFries and I'm excited for uh, for what looks like possibly a, a move to Alpha Terry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it sounds like you're on board like I was with Mick Schumacher and still am. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that to Nick DeFries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, my, look, my, my personal thoughts were that I, I thought, look, if Albon wasn't going to be back for Singapore, Singapore is more of a street circuit and it was going to give everybody a bit of a chance to see how he does, not just in that Williams, but how he does on a street circuit and a bit of a variety in in circuits um, just in, in, in F1. Um, but look, obviously that's not needed. He's uh, the, the, the conversations are already being had. Um, but what do you think, Azidra? Do you think this is a no-brainer for Alpha Tauri, Helmut Marko? I mean, they give Nick DeFries a shot for 2023, maybe sign him to a short-term contract on a sort of a trial base as a, you know, for for effectively the B team. Um, and if it doesn't go their way, they've got Colton Herta, hopefully, if he finishes top five in the championship for 2024. What do you think? Um, it's it's a good move for Alfa Tauri if they, if they sign Nick. However, he might not be interested in just be there for a year, thinking that in one year's time, Colton can come and he lose his seat. If Williams would uh, make him an offer for more years and more money, probably he would uh, prefer to be with Williams, be secure with Williams for two, three, four years, mm. rather than just one year testing with AlphaTauri, and then he'll be without a seat. 
after after that year. So I'm not sure. It's a good move, but I'm not sure if Nick would be interested in just stay one year in AlphaTauri without any sort of assurance that he would stay there or move move up. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And look, as as you say, like it's, I mean, no driver is probably going to be willing to accept a one year contract because you know what that spells. You know, you, you do you do bad in two races, and all of a sudden you're you're cast aside. I mean, we only have to look at what's happening with uh, Mick Schumacher this this season. Actually, I'm going to jump in and just randomly throw things all over the place here for a second. Mm-hmm. Talking about Mick Schumacher as the fanboy that I am, um, <laughs> I see I saw a news story there just saying basically um, Gunter Steiner saying that you know, that they are considering Schumacher for a drive next year, but sort of saying that he needs to, the, what's going against him is his lack of consistency. And I was like, his lack of consistency. I had to go back and check. He's finished above Kevin Magnussen in sort of five out of the last six races. And I think one of them, he had a DNF or something like that. Mm. So you're like, you gave him the ultimatum sort of saying that, you know, that you need to step up your game. And he stepped up his game and he's outperforming his teammate, give or take most races. So what's the issue here? There's something else going, uh, something else at play here. And uh, as a Mick Schumacher fan, I am getting to the bottom of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a fuck if you're at the top. Sorry. <laughs> it, it, does, it does feel as if there's a bit of a power play going on uh, back and forth between Schumacher, depending on who's in the better position. Like w- when Schumacher was on the verge of that Alpine, was it the Alpine deal? Yeah. Um, it seemed like every all the chips were in his favor and you heard nothing from Gunther. But now that uh, it seems that Schumacher is destined somewhat to stay at Haas next year, Gunther's back out talking again. Um I'm not yeah. I'm not keen on this at all. No, I don't like the way it's going down. I think he's he's been like I said, it, it's a power play and it's uh, it's it's not a nice way of, of doing business for in any sense, but especially uh with the driver's career. And I hope for Mick Schumacher's sake, that his agent is in deep talks with the likes of Williams and stuff like that for Latifi seat, because um, I'd say it would be nice to uh, to be able to give a middle finger to Gunter Steiner after the way he's coming out and talking about Mick Schumacher. But hey, that's just me <laughs> flying off the handle a little bit. <laughs> but look, speaking of Williams, anyway, let's. Uh, I mean, this the news about Nick DeFries possibly going to. Um, to Alpha Terry, I mean, that sort of comes at the expense of Williams. I mean, I think they thought if that wasn't going to happen, then they had a sure thing of a swap swap out, just drop Latifi out and drop Nick DeFries in. I think that was going to be a fairly straightforward move. I mean, especially given that the, sort of the negative spotlight that Latifi has put himself in after Monza, given, you know, outperformed by a guy who had 30 minutes in a car prior to qualifying. But, uh, and then also you have... <laughs> Latifi coming out with ridiculous statements saying that his car is best suited for defending and you're thinking there is nobody behind you to defend the only thing you're defending against is your rear wheels overtaking you when you spin out like so so I mean if De Vries isn't going to go to Williams uh, are they looking at say the likes of Logan Sargent maybe like I said Mick Schumacher we were mentioning earlier but maybe Logan Sargent and again with Logan Sargent we come into the the issue with the super license again, because Logan, Logan Sargent doesn't have all his points needed for uh, the super license. He needs to finish in the top five in the F2 championship this year um, to earn them. So who do you think uh, will uh, stick their arse in that empty seat at Williams, Scotty? Tell well, me. I, as you say, that well, Logan Sargent, he's, what, he's currently third uh, in F2 at the moment. So he's, yeah. he's right in there with a the chance. Um, I, I like uh, Fittipaldi. Um, that's a bit mm, of a... A random shot out of the dark, but he's done some testing uh, with Haas, and he was driving for Haas when Mazepin um, was gone at the start of the season. Um, I, I like that shout, but I I think it surely could end you put up... though in order you would you'd surely have to go with sort of Schumacher, Logan Sargent, and then sort of whoever else is on the roster after that. Yeah, I think it, I think it goes to someone who's already on the grid. I I imagine maybe a Danny Ricardo, but. I I think his uh, his options are are drying up very quickly. 
Well, s- slow your roll, Scotty. We're going to get to Daniel Ricciardo in a, <laughs> in a minute. Um, yeah, I don't know. Williams, I think, I'd, I'd liken it to um, you go to a disco, you meet a girl, and you get a number, and you suddenly assume that you're going out or something. Um, <laughs> and so Williams have jumped the gun on this one, I think. Um, and uh, he De, De Vries isn't promised to anyone just yet. I would like to see him in, at Williams, I, I, I think. But yeah, um, I, I think if Helmut Marco gets his way, he's going to Alpha Terry. I don't think yeah. I don't think yeah. Williams have the have the clout to um to to, to go toe to toe with Red Bull in order to get a driver, I don't think. Yeah. But I mean, look, as you mentioned, Daniel Ricardo, and before we move on from the, the, the news about the driver market, we'll have a quick look into Ricardo's situation. And I mean, we mentioned it before countless times on the podcast that we did think it was going to be difficult for Ricardo to get a drive for next year um, and could quite easily find himself sitting on the sidelines for t- certainly for 2023 and maybe even sort of permanently. And sort of as the weeks have been going on, we see other drivers now being linked quite heavily with the empty seats and less and less about Ricardo. So it wasn't looking too good. And then we see, I'm not sure how long ago it was now, it was at, uh, I think it was from Monza, wasn't it? The video of Ricardo having a conversation with Perez um, where he's quoted as saying, I'm going to take a year off and come back in 2024. So with that statement in mind, Scotty, we had a feeling this was going to happen. So this is not a surprise. So we're not shedding tears here. <laughs> but <laughs> granted, it's not completely confirmed. And I'm sure they, uh, they're they going to try and work a deal out right up until until the, the final hour. But what's the likelihood of them finding the seat in 2023? And like, sorry, especially given that all the names we're hearing linked to the empty seats and he's not really in amongst them. Yeah. Um. <sighs> It, it doesn't look good for him. It really doesn't. No. I, it, I think it highly depends on on other things. What what other, what other things happen? It's, if, if he does get a seat, it's going to be someone who is out of options for uh, for a driver to come in. So Williams, they just don't have an option and Danny Ricciardo is sitting there waiting. But the other thing is, if he takes a year out, I'd be very worried for Daniel Ricciardo that he won't get away back in because... You know, he's not setting the world on fire. I know he's a fantastic driver and all, but he hasn't set the world on fire and he's he's not picking up points. I, I This F1 world moves fast and it'll move yeah. on fairly quickly from Danny Ricardo. Yeah, absolutely. And look, Scotty said it there as well as he drove, like, you know, if he does take a year out, the likelihood, you know, that he's going to be in danger of trying to work his way back in. What what do you think? Do you think he's going to be, if he did take a year out, do you think he's going to be able to get himself back on the grid in 2024? I mean, is there going to be an open seat in 2024? I mean, who who could who could we see bowing out? I mean, a lot of contracts are being renewed at the moment, so they're going to be renewed for a number of years. So um, the only way of getting a driver out would be to terminate a contract. So in 2024, so what, what's it, what, what are you thinking? Do you think he's going to make a, a way back in or will there be a way back in for him? Uh, I don't think so. If he leaves this year... Uh... It's very difficult to come back. He might be spending the season 20, 23, 24 being a commentator for Sky F1, <laughs> and that's it. That's as close as he'll be from F1. I know that uh, Lewis Hamilton was saying that he was too good to be a reserve driver for Mercedes, but at least that way he would still be in the F1 and could still drive. Every now and then, I mean, Lewis Hamilton has back problems every now and then, so mm. you never know, Ricard could have a way there. But if he leaves, that's it. That's end game for him. And do you know, and I know there's some diehard Daniel Ricciardo fans out there, and I'm sorry for saying this, but I have absolutely no sympathy for him whatsoever. He bounced around. He's the architect of his own downfall. He was at Red Bull. He moved on from Red Bull, and he just... He just bounced around from team after that. And you're thinking, settle into a project. Build, grow with a team. Work towards something. He should have stuck at Renault. He should have stuck at McLaren. Like, just work towards something. Build something. But he's just jumping around. Ah, anyway, look, I'm going to rant. I'm, I'm going to stop. Scotty, what do you got to say from, from... Um, are we, are you defending or are you against? <laughs> I'm, no, no, no. I'm, I'm with you. I, I just Whenever a challenge seems to face... Danny Ricardo, he seems to back away and look for a new project. Red yeah. Bull, Verstappen was there. He knew what he was up against. Yeah. He bowed out. Every team he's been at, a challenge has faced him and he hasn't performed. 
I yeah, I hundred percent agree. I just think he's he's not. Look, it look we we can't say it, he's not putting in the work. I mean, it's not a case that, but there is something there that he he's chasing a team to get him a world title rather than working with a team to get there. I mean, yeah. Alpine are more than capable of winning a world title, not in the current car, but the project I'm sure is going to be more than capable within the years Daniel Ricciardo would have had possibly left in F1. McLaren, likewise, certainly Red Bull. It, it like, I mean, there was no reason why he couldn't have challenged Max Verstappen for a world title. I mean, Nico Rosberg did it uh, with Lewis Hamilton. And when Nico Rosberg won the world title uh, in um, with Mercedes, like I, that was largely down to a lot of um, DNFs and uh, reliability issues from... Lewis Hamilton, like it, no, there was some great toe-to-toe racing. Don't get me wrong, but I don't think necessarily Daniel Ricciardo would have won. Or sorry, <laughs> Nico Rosberg would have won that world championship had the reliability issues not been creeping in for Lewis Hamilton. Hmm. So there would have been a chance even in Red Bull. Just you know, if, if you could sort of stick with Max Verstappen, um, you know, it, it, it's motor racing. Anything can happen to give you that 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 win or or maximize your points. So, oh look, I, I'm I'm sort of uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm going off script. <laughs> <laughs> he annoys me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just does. Like uh, I mean, uh, and, and okay, look, one one last thing, and then he comes on, and he's got the big cheesy grin on his head, and you're like, just crack on, lad, work, do something. Like you just poke him with a stick, do something, Daniel, will you? <laughs> All right, right, I'm finished. I'm finished. I'm sorry. All right, Monaco, lads. <laughs> From one disaster to another. One disaster to another. Like so, let's let's be honest. So look, uh, Monaco's sticking around for 2023, for better or worse, and for worse, they've decided to hike up the ticket prices by 30. percent So uh, just to add insult to injury, I mean, they were saying that the cost, the cheapest ticket now is going to be 700 euros for a race weekend, and the cheapest ticket up for a day ticket will be on the Friday, which is 150 euros just to go and see free practice. So, I mean, this circuit splits opinion. So, I mean, some like the focus on, some like that it focuses on the qualifying, that that's the priority here. Um, others, you know, I, I suppose, others think that there should be purely from a historical standpoint that it should be there. I mean, look, then there's the other side that think it's it's not fit for purpose. And I, I, I think that's kind of where I'm sitting on the fence, or sorry, that's the side of the fence I'm sitting on is that it's not fit for purpose currently. Um, so the first question on this is, Idro, is which side of the fence do you sit on this? Um, you'll have to nail your colors to the mast here. Should it be on the calendar? Should it be there? Yeah, it should be there. It's, uh, yeah. it's a classic race <laughs> and uh, it has a good scenery. The Dano, uh, the Marine, it's it's a nice race. There's a problem though that F1 cars are growing bigger and bigger, and those streets in Monaco are still the same as back in the 70s. So would you not so, suspend it until they've resolved that issue? I mean, you can't surely just keep putting the cars out that as they're getting bigger and bigger, and I mean it just becomes a parade. It's just a an F1 parade mid-season. <laughs> Let's have a parade, like you know, it's. Yeah. Yeah, the like say Paddy's day. Focus. We're just missing the tractor at the front, just towing a trailer with some straw well, bales on it. You get, you get more overtaken in the Paddy's there. day parade. <laughs> you would get more overtaken in Paddy, Paddy's day parade. Yeah, <laughs> little five year old doing our little twirl with the the, the baton <laughs> and stuff like like. <laughs> sorry, Isidro, I cut across you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, man. So, well, the the tractor will be uh, with Latifi driving the tractor. For sure. <laughs> well, he but might not be there to... next year. Oh yeah, well, he might... yeah, exactly. He's there driving the tractor. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> but um, yeah, the in Monaco qualifying the Saturday is probably what defines the race on the next day, because overtaking someone is it's not impossible, but it's very very difficult. I and mean, you rely on DNFs to to win positions or uh, pit crew. Pit stops, uh, screw ups. I mean, we have to look out to Ferrari. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to look at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> go big, go home. Um, yeah. you only have to look at like I mean, they don't even st- get get the car, the race started, even with the sort of a bit of rain coming down. Is it, like it's just, I, I, I have no time for for Monaco. Like I love Monaco from a historical standpoint, and yes, if the cars were smaller, I, I would never see it leave the calendar. 
But unfortunately, it gets to Monaco. And rather than being like, oh, brilliant, it's Monaco. All I'm buzzed about is the build up and the qualifying. Come race day, I'm like, Pfft. you know, you're just praying for an accident or a D- DNF or some some drama in the pit. You're just you're waiting for something outside of the, the control of a driver to happen. Um, today for the strategist for all teams. I don't basically. even know whether there's much to gain from strategy other than your pit stop, if you can. But I mean, if you're not in first place, uh, leading the, the 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 leading the race, I mean, there's not much you can do with strategy that you're not just going to come out at the back of the pack anyway. Uh, well, Ferrari in that day. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. That's true. Well, I mean, look, same question to you, Scotty. Uh, before I keep ranting and rambling, um, do you think you should be there next year and? If it should be there next year, what do you make of this 30% increase on the ticket price for fans? No, I don't think it should. And I, I think it should be a 30% decrease on ticket prices. The entertainment value isn't there. Um, I, I personally think there's, if there's tracks like this, historical tracks, they should be in a rotation year by year where there's maybe four historical tracks that aren't that great, but because of the history of them, they still need to be in there. Yeah. So every four years we get a rotation of, okay, this year it's Monaco, next year it's blah, 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 whatever. And then we, they're all about upping the, the entertainment value of this sport, and they're trying to push it into that arena where it competes with the likes of football. And yeah. if you want to do that, putting on a boring-ass race and upping the ticket prices is not the way to go, I don't think. Nope. Yeah, uh, no, exactly, 100%. And, uh, I mean, look, Isidro, me and Scotty are talking common sense. Join us. <laughs> <laughs> Join us here on the dark side. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, 100% agree, 100% agree. And uh, speaking of uh, sort of changes and, and, and you know, being on the calendar, what not on the calendar, uh, Stefano Domenicali, making some big suggestions here about possible changes in the future for F1. And I understand changes are needed, you know, and, you know, things need, do need to be kept exciting. Um, but he's talking about, yeah, and he's using language like inverted grids rather than a reverse grid. He's saying an inverted grid and possibly points for free practice sessions. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, this this bugs me, um, but he's he's coming from it from a point that, you know, there was a couple of races previous now where we've had the likes of Sainz, Hamilton, Verstappen, etc., coming from the back of the grid, and it provides some excitement and drama. But for me, I think we're just we're making we're artificially enhancing the sport at the at the the sacrifice of drivers who are actually deserving to be at the at the front. So teams teams and drivers that are deserving to be at the front are being handicapped just for the sake of the spectacle and the entertainment. Um, that's just my opinion on it, but Scotty, like before I continue on with my rant, <laughs> inverted grids, yay or nay. And when I say inverted grids, I'm going to su- say what he's suggesting here is not what the current F2, he's possibly thinking full. a full inverted grid, which means, you know, first place becomes last place and last place becomes first and everything in between. Yeah, I'm, oh. a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a no on this as well. Uh, again, I'm, I, I hate to keep bringing it back to football, but it's like a lower uh, table team uh, going out onto the pitch and they're playing Man United and Man United have to have, like tie their hands behind their back uh, well, be, for 90 well, minutes. <laughs> well, it'd be like, it'd be like uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd, it'd be, who's at the bottom of the Premier League at the moment? Uh, Leicester. So it'd be like Leicester going out against Arsenal who are at the top or something, or Man City, whatever. And uh, sorry, everybody who has no idea about uh, Premier League sport. <laughs> um, but it'd be like Leicester going out and saying, okay, you're up against Man City. Um, so because they're at the top of the table, we're going to give Man C- or Leicester will start the game with a 3-0 yeah, head yeah, yeah, start. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Man City would be like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, can you imagine telling Lewis Hamilton or, or Charles Leclerc as they get pole position? Well done, Charles, you're on pole in p20 and you're like what the <laughs> fuck <laughs> yeah no i'm not with this yeah stefano you know you can stick that p20 like um isidro what's your thoughts and i hope to god it's not like your monaco thoughts. <laughs> well, well, i'm be. a guest again yeah i have to agree that it sounds good the idea of uh the the first starts last because we've seen a lot of races where max for instance has 30 seconds away from everyone and he's just alone no one sees him driving. He's just driving alone there. 
and the action is actually happening in the mid uh, fighting for P10 or fighting for P4. A couple of years ago, Lewis Hamilton, when Mercedes was very strong, Lewis was alone in front of Rosberg, and the race would be just two of them with 30, 40 seconds away from everyone else. So in the scenario of reverse grid, at least the, there will be some action before they get they get away from everyone. Is he and Can we've I seen throw... in his race that Leclerc, Max, Lewis, they all have the skills just to drive, go past all all the drivers and finish first. So it will be the uh, so it will be the same as they do sometimes with the penalties. Can but I they throw do have to give points for practice or qualifying just to justify the, the the drivers to actually get the first place in pole, even if it means they will start from last. Well, can I throw a hypothetical at you here, Azero? Yeah. If you're at work and you're like and you're going home to your wife and you're like, Woo, I just got a promotion. And you're like, and then you go into the office the next day and your boss goes, Great stuff, Azero. Thanks for all the hard work over 10 years. Now we're gonna start you off in the tea room. So, uh, <laughs> two sugars, loads of milk. <laughs> yeah. I mean, bum. <laughs> are you just, yeah, slap on the arse, yeah, to fucking hashtag me too for a zero all the way. <laughs> and I mean, are you going to be like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm ace at my job. I know I'm going to, I'm going to make my way all the way back up. <laughs> Welcome to <laughs> management. Welcome to management. I mean, these teams have worked and, and the drivers have worked to, to be in the position to where they are. I think the, my argument would be that it's up to Formula One in the in the regulations to enable a closer a, a, um, uh, condensing the the gap in in the pack and allowing the, the the sort of the teams at the back, the likes of the Haas, the Williams, Aston Martins, to have the ability to move up to um, the likes of Mercedes, Red Bull, and Ferrari. I think that's up to Formula One to do that with the regulations. And not by artificially just throwing people at the back. Oh my God, there's hands everywhere. Like this, <laughs> we should have done a whole podcast just on this. All right, well, let's start with Scotty. <laughs> um, you kind of touched on it there. I mean, wh where is the incentive if if this if that was to take off? And say a Williams and an Aston Martin start picking up points. Where is the incentive then for them to develop the car to be a better car? They're sitting there getting points. They're like, okay, our shitty car is picking up points because of this re reverse grid. Why would we develop it if we can just qualify 15th but start 5th? Well, especially if uh, Latifi saying that his car is better for defending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, well, I'm bossing this because I'm shit at qualifying, <laughs> and, uh, but I'm going to be able to keep everybody behind me. I can defend from first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, look, I know we're, we're saying this in, in, in sort of joke and stuff like that because we don't really know how... Um, the inverted grid will work how the qualifying work i mean will it be a sprint race that will decide an inverted grid for the for the main race or will it just be an inverted race sorry will it be an inverted um grid qualifying. for a sprint race Quali yeah for a qualifying race or whatever you want to call it and then whatever the results are from the inverted grid sprint race fucking name 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 pro max um <laughs> Um, so we don't know. We don't know. But sorry, Azidro, you wanted to say something as well in this mess that we've just created. <laughs> my my take was just that if we want to to give everyone the chance, then the cars should, should be more or less the same and let the drivers shine. Like F2, for instance. Cars are all the same. It's up to the driver to see how, how good he is. So in F1, then probably... If we don't want to reverse grid, then we need to tackle because we'll have very good cars in the first six positions and then it's uh, lower teams on the other ones and we never see that much action in the races then. Yeah, Unless no, there's a middle ground. There's no, too much gap on the technical perspective. No, you're right. And that's and that's what we were saying. Like in, in, in it would be nice for the regulations to be able to close that gap a little bit more. And like you say, F two is a great example that they all sort of run the same sort of um configurations and powertrains and stuff like that for uh, for races so there's uh, and the, the same chassis and stuff like that so there's um it's all sort of done by the driver give or take so i think um uh yeah i have to say 
I, I, I don't think I, that's never going to happen to start with because the, the the likes of Mercedes and the teams that are putting in mega money for developing are are never going to allow that to happen. But you know it, that that would be the dream scenario if there was a bit more of a level playing field. Um, Scotty, yeah, what were you going to say? But isn't that half the fun of F one? Is what is this team developing? They've the the rumors of I've developed or they've developed this and they're they're bringing it out at this race and seeing how that performs. That's half of the fun of it. Yeah. Um, I think, I, yeah. I think what this, sorry, Scotty, go on. No, 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 I was done. I think another area that needs to be clamped down, and again, we'll, we'll move on from this because we, we have spent a lot longer on this than we <laughs> should have. Um, but to try and, uh, try and close that, uh, that development gap a little bit more as well is like teams are being able to use um, sort of sister companies and stuff like that. So outside, so stuff that's not, say, for example, Red Bull, They've reached their budget, we'll say, for example. I, I can't think I can't remember the exact uh, number off the top of my head, but they've reached their, their budget, we'll say, as an example. Well, they can have a sister company that's sort of owned by Red Bull, but not related to F Bo- Red Bull F1 racing, uh, develop a component that can then be used by Red Bull. So, so they can develop stuff with other companies that aren't, aren't sort of seen under the the budget cap they're not they don't they're not going to they're not going to come under the budget cap because they're not part of the F1 team effectively um so if they have partnerships with other um you know suppliers manufacturers or you know uh, component manufacturers and stuff like that they can have them put funding into components that Red Bull can then use but that actually then doesn't come out of Red Bull's budget cap. So there's issues there that have to be resolved where lower down teams, like again, like the likes of Williams and stuff like that, will never have that um, ability to do that. Um, so look, yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So let's, um, I'm going to shut up. We're all shut up. <laughs> we, 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 we've got, because we still have one more point. I want to talk about the, the point of free practice. So let's, uh, I hope to God we're all on the same page of this. Otherwise strap in for another 15 minutes. Um, so, okay, God, let me recompose myself here. What are we talking about here? Right, points, free practice. He's talking about this as well. This is just nonsense if you ask me, but I'm assuming he's talking about, he wants basically the whole weekend to lead towards the title. He wants every component, every part of the weekend to be competitive. So I'm assuming he's talking about in free practice that, you know, it's down to the fastest lap. You know, whoever gets the fastest lap gets three points, second fastest lap gets two points, and third gets one point or something to that effect. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming they'll do that for free practice one and free practice two or something like that. Um, yeah, I think it's nonsense. Absolute rubbish. I mean, those free practices are there for the teams to to, to um, configure their car for the quality and for the race. But uh, I don't know. Let's start with Isidro. What do you make of this? I agree with you. There's, it's nonsense. The DFPs are, like you're saying, it's for the teams to make sure they have they want to test configuration A, B, and C before the main, uh, before the qualification. And also, they sometimes use uh, other drivers on the FPs mm. just to test if uh, they are good enough or their skills for this car or this race or this configuration. Having points on that, it would, it would mean that some of the drivers would never get the F1 seat even for a few hours. Yeah, exactly. So, no. Yeah, no, 100%, 100%. And um, all right, well, that's that's <clears throat> excuse me, that's two out of three. Scotty, where do you stand on this? Don't I, just be, don't, don't throw in. A, I love I, it just as. <laughs> I dis no, I don't. I I agree. Yeah, and uh, Isidro made the point that I was going to make. You just wouldn't see any of these younger drivers getting an opportunity. If there's points up for grabs, then it's it's always going to be the most competitive foot forward. And yeah, that would destroy that that chance for younger drivers. So yeah, yeah no, that's a terrible idea. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. All right, <clears throat> let's draw a line under that. Stefano, stick it. Um, <laughs> right, I want to just, I'm just going to briefly gloss over uh, Alpine's Driver Academy situation. There was a comment made uh, in an interview with Laurent Rossi from Alpine, and they're sort of saying that they're considering not continuing their Driver Academy um, after the Piastri situation. <clears throat> so for me now, I think this is a bit of sour grapes, and they're just taking their ball and going home type thing. Um, they're sort of saying that you know, if there's sort of if there's no loyalty, you know, and they've no protection, what is the point in them having a driver academy, putting all the money into a you know, investing in an academy driver, and then that uh, driver can just all of a sudden up sticks and leave to a rival, uh, a rival team. 
um, which I get that. Um, now, there is a counter to that from Mark Weber, where he's insisting that, you know, the, the numbers that Alpine were throwing around were sort of nonsense. <clears throat> and that Alpine have actually um, contributed less than 20% of Piastri's, the funds put in for Piastri's junior career. And that actually his father and sponsors have put in something in the region of 6 million to get him to where he is at the moment. Um, and then, you know, 20%, either 20% of that or 20% on top of that is where Alpine has stepped in. So um, <clears throat> on this, just quick, quick answer from both of you. Are we thinking that, yeah, Alpine are just throwing their toys out of the pram a little bit here and they're just being a little bit overdramatic? Or have they got a point that Piastri, I mean, we don't know the ins and outs of the contract and how he got out of that contract, but should there be maybe a bit more of an ironclad contract with the academy drivers that if they are investing money, even if it is only 20%, that they should um, be first have first refusal on them for a uh, you know, an F1 seat for at least uh, maybe say a year or two years. Um, I don't know. Who wants to take this one? I say, Joe, why don't you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I agree. They should uh, have some sort of contract in place yeah, because they are investing, even if it's not much, they are investing in the driver. So there should be some uh, uh, some some points in there to force, not force, but to make sure that the driver doesn't get the benefits of the academy and then jumps off and goes to another team. Yeah. Yeah, I I'd, I'd agree with that. Um and would you would you be uh, what what are you thinking Scotty as well? Would you you reckon they yeah, should have something in the contract to lock a driver in a little bit more? Um they should, but if they don't then tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that, that is a good point. Yeah. You know, it, it's up to each team or each academy to make sure that they they talk to the driver and they come up with a contract that suits both sides. I, I'm, not, I'm not in agreement that, that um, the academy can mess around the driver either and hold them up and go, you you know, we, we're, we're not ready to have you in here. So there's another two years we have to sit around just waiting for us to be ready. Yeah. In, in that circumstance, the driver should have some power to go, well, I want to, you know, I want to push my career forward and I should be able to do that. So, yeah, no, tough. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, look, if uh, if there was that sort of leeway in the contract and he exploited it, well, then that's uh, Alpine's issue, not uh, not the drivers. So, yeah, maybe they should just learn their lesson and resolve that in their next contracts with their drivers rather than throwing their toys at the pram and publicly saying, oh, we're not going to bother with the driver academy anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> but uh, sorry, I keep clearing my throat here. I hope that's not wrecking everyone's head on he who's listening on headphones. Um, but, uh, right. Okay. Re finally, now the last thing, Red Bull and Porsche, um, the deal between these two, which was probably sort of one of the most certain changes we expected. I mean, this was all, but a done deal for the 2026, um, sort of regulation changes and, and season, but that seems to have been not, not only completely broken down, but by the sounds of it, it's done, gone, and will never be revisited. And a lot of speculation of the reason behind this. I mean, we knew there was supposed to be some sort of 50-50 partnership. So possibly Porsche were expecting something that Red Bull didn't want to offer. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's probably not the end of the world for Red Bull, Scotty. I mean, they've just invested heavily in their uh, new facility for the Red Bull powertrains, which, you know, everything seems to be going sort of uh, pretty well so far with this. And I mean, Helmut Marko has mentioned as well that they've had contact from other manufacturers since the Porsche deal collapsed as well. Um, so, you know, they're, they're not short of an offer if they, if they need to, uh, um, sort of, uh, explore that further. But so, I mean, do Red Bull really need Porsche, uh, Isidro? Sorry, Scotty. I was, I mean, I was directing that Isidro, but <laughs> do, uh, Red Bull really needs, uh, Porsche Isidro or was it more Porsche needed Red Bull? I think it's more Porsche needed the Red Bull to come in into the F1. So without having a work team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Red Bull has been. They know their way around. They've been a few years, so they have the experience. Porsche was just trying to jump on that wagon and almost take over Red Bull on the F1. Yeah. So it's definitely it's uh, for Red Bull. It's fine not to be not to have Porsche on board. All right. Well, look, I think that's it for for this week's episode, folks. Um, we will be back for the Singapore Grand Prix. So keep tuned for that when uh, when that is up. Um. As always, if you want to get in touch with us with your own questions, comments, corrections, send them on to feedback at late night race and anywhere you see us on social media. 
But until next time. 